Yeah, you can see, see this just the first slide just says United Neighbors, right? Everyone's seen that? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so what we did, we started with the Los Angeles typical piece of property with a single family house on it. We did our study based on Los Angeles ordinances. Every city's got their own. We're not going to worry about that. We're just going to move through it. This is a single family lot, about 7,500 square feet. Current law allows everybody to put a junior ADU. In this case, we took over the garage and we added an ADU in the back. Okay. SB9 allows every, will allow every existing residential property to become a duplex. Okay. It also has changed all our zoning so that now the local government may require setbacks up to four feet on the side and rear lot lines. Okay, that's important because now you look at a diagram, this is that same lot that had that single family house and then had the ADU and junior ADU. It can now be split in half. You can make them two stories and have two houses now that are uh, the same size. You have a junior ADU and an ADU in the back that this is only four foot side yard, two story houses to get the square footage on the property. Okay. In SB9, there's a paragraph that talks about that objective zoning standards, objective subdivision standards, and objective design review standards still have value. And, and this is very confusing and it fools a lot of people, but it's not the case. Uh, the next page in, in SB9 has this one sentence. And this is the crux of the whole law. A local agency shall not impose objective zoning standards, objective subdivision standards, and objective design review standards that would have the effect of physically precluding the construction of two units on either of the resulting parcels. This is because they allow you to split the property in two equal halves. And when you read this, two units is not defined by size. So only thing that's gonna limit the size of a building on a property are the four foot side and rear yards. So in Los Angeles, we have manifestation ordinances, they're blown away. So now it's just what you have with your, your rear and side yards and the front setback and whatever the height limit is allowed in the city. So the last diagram showed duplexes and ADU and junior ADU, SB9 leaves the decision if you want to have a, an ADU to the local jurisdiction, but you can have a duplex and an ADU on both properties when you split them in half. So the, this diagram previous that had four units per side, that's eight units where it used to be one house, or it could end up being six, but the square footage is still the same. This just shows a cross cut and east west cut as opposed to the north south cut. It's important that both lots are exactly the same size. So in SB9, it says you can have an access easement. You don't have to have a right of way. So to get to this house in the rear, this is an easement across the front property. But in this case, we're showing the developer put two duplexes in the front, a small ADU and a large house in the back. Because the only thing that is limiting you are these four foot setbacks. So how does it impact a typical neighborhood? This is our typical suburban neighborhood. And then this is showing what happens when you have uh, all these developers come in and put the, their SB9 development on it. There's, and there's no required infrastructure improvements. The developer does not have to improve the infrastructure. And there's minimal off-street parking. So SB10 then allows 10 unit apartments on the same property. So this is our 7,500 square foot lot where the single house was. Now you have a 10 unit apartment house. And to lay it out, that makes it four stories or a 45 foot high building in the middle of a single family neighborhood. We assumed five foot and 15 foot uh, setbacks. There's no affordable housing required. In SB10, this building can happen in a transit rich or a job rich area. And the definition of job rich is any community that would make somebody's commute shorter on their way to work. So if you're in Los Angeles and you're in deep in the north part of the valley, you pass through the middle of the valley, the southern part of the valley to get to Beverly Hills for work, 
you have created all these different job-rich communities on the way. Okay, so why would developers want to put a 10-unit apartment house in the middle of a single-family neighborhood? Well, that's kind of obvious when you're, I'm an architect, I do apartment houses, I do mixed use. Uh, if you're building on a commercial zone, you have entitlements to go through and those can be costly and they can be time consuming and you also have infrastructure that you have to improve. If you're building in a single family zone by SB10, there's no uh, entitlements because it's by right and there's no infrastructure improvement required. So why wouldn't you come in and do this? So here we're showing three of these red boxes or, or the 10 unit apartment houses in the middle of a block. So I'm a developer who's gonna be building on Ventura Boulevard here in Sherman Oaks where we are, uh, or I could buy three lots just to block off Ventura Boulevard and have absolutely no problem building three much cheaper units with minimal parking. Okay, so how does this impact our communities? Here is a bigger look at the community before SB uh, 9 and 10 as it is today. And this is after SB 9 and 10. We have plenty of underutilized capacity in our commercial zones to meet our housing needs without destroying our single family neighborhoods. I don't care what community in California you're in, this is true. Okay, so we wanna wrap it up with three, three simple comparison slides. So this is kind of environmental issues. On the left, you have the existing uh, single family neighborhood where you have rear yards, front yards, trees, and grass. When your same neighborhood has SB9 and 10 developments in it, you have minimal off-street parking. So you have lots of cars trying to park on the street. You have uh, loss of yards, loss of trees, and loss of permeable surfaces. So we lose the ability for the ground to absorb the water and uh, replenish our, our, uh, our, our uh, groundwater. And so now, this one shows infrastructure improvement, who pays? You now, on the existing block, you have water and your sewer and your gas in the street. You're not gonna wor worry about power and, and that right now. When you come in and you build what used to be 10 units to about, now about 60 units here, who's gonna pay for the water, sewer and gas upgrade? These little pipes will not handle the water needs or the uh, effluent being flushed out of those houses. Uh, as, as they stand now. So who's gonna pay for it? Not the developer. And then, so we end up with why ruin old established stable neighborhoods when we can put more housing on our underdeveloped commercial corridors? Is this just to help the real estate industry? If affordability is the goal, why are our legislators doing this? As Maria said, we're breaking up into several different subgroups. We are also gonna have a group that's gonna actually study real world solutions to affordability.